Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Uh, thanks for your patience while John made me look foolish on stage. I apologize, I'm out of breath. Um, this is almost like when you're working from home and the boss calls and you gotta quickly shut the Xbox off and then pretend like you've been working the whole time. I feel like that's what I just went through. So thank you again for being here. I hope you enjoyed, uh, this might have been the premiere, if you hadn't seen it already, of our new Root Happy uh, infomercial. Um, we're gonna pick up some of the conversations that we've had earlier today on what uh, t uh, Alex and Tom talked about around uh, presenting the offer and what Ellen and Connie talked about and the great work Expedia is doing in the merchandising of airline content. <clears throat> I will catch my breath, I promise. So, the folk, just to set the stage, the focus of our discussion for the next 40 minutes or so is really about presenting the offer or what we like to call merchandising the airline offer. <sighs> the reason that that's important is that there, uh, a significant amount of investment by airlines, technology companies, goes into the first two steps, creating the offer and distributing the offer. That's table stakes for any airline to really compete and optimize their revenue. The challenge for much of the industry is that the presenting the offer is often the last thing that gets thought about or gets left behind. So we're gonna to talk today to some industry experts who are really setting the tone on how to optimize that and get the last remaining dollars out of the shopping basket, uh, regardless of where customers are shopping for their content. I wanna highlight two headlines as part of the conversation to just to reiterate how important this is and how important your leaders as an, uh, at the airlines think this is. Robin Hayes, the CEO of JetBlue, recently presented the, I, uh, the IATA AGM chairs report which is a summary of what the airline CEOs believe are the priorities for the industry. And one of those priorities this year was about true, re, uh, true airline retailing. That means that travelers are able to see the value of what is being offered by the airline beyond the base fare, regardless of channel. They wanna unlock the value of all the investments they're making in products, travel experiences, aircraft, by putting the customer first. So airline CEOs have said, this is a mandate, we've got to solve this. <clears throat> the second point that we wanna highlight is a recent uh, report by McKinsey. Uh, it's called The Six Secrets of Profitable Airlines. And they, one thing they highlighted is what, one thing we've always known, customers are no longer buying tickets based on price and schedule. Those days are over. So having developed a quality product, the next step that the most profitable airlines are taking is getting passengers excited about the journey in the shopping path. We're gonna talk about how that's working out for, for airlines who are optimizing that today. One of the channel partners that we work with is Trip Actions. Trip Actions has uh, introduced uh, the, uh, Root Happy ATP, the ATP Go Root Happy solution. And when they started presenting rich content in the purchase path versus the legacy commoditized displays of schedules and price, they saw a 35% increase in premium bookings. So what that means is people that were looking at a basic fare, they saw 35% more of those consumers buy up to a main cabin type fare. Significant dollars that are often lost by airlines when they're not effectively merchandising their products. ATP Co recently uh, held a, a, a survey of global airline travelers to see if we get other perspectives on how airline or how customers behave in the shopping path and what we found was that 80% of shoppers are more likely to book when they see targeted visuals. So beyond basic commoditized content, 80% of them wanna see more about their travel experience so they have more control over what they're buying. 63% of the people we surveyed prefer to see images of the actual travel experience on board. So customize imagery to the plane that they're on to the type of seat that they're in. Customers are voting with their pocketbooks, and when they see this imagery, they can better understand what they're buying, the conversion rates are higher. So we know where we've been. We'd like to say green screen, this one's blue, but this is where we started. We've shifted from the legacy ways of selling airline tickets. We're less and less B to uh, B, we're more B to C. And what we're seeing is airlines working very hard to decommoditize what they offer to the marketplace and they're improving their displays with rich visual content that lets the consumer decide how they want to invest in their trip. 
And the airlines that are doing that, we hear on a, a continuous basis is, they're seeing better performance when they do it versus when they don't. The challenge that we have is still limited adoption in the marketplace. We've still got a lot of uh, airlines who uh, have not quite uh, uh, solved the omni-channel merchandising opportunity. And uh, there's just opportunities for them to capitalize on additional uh, revenue in each transaction, higher conversion rates, higher customer satisfaction, higher margins. So what we're gonna do over the next few minutes is uh, share some feedback from an industry expert uh, who works with many airlines and in other industries on what best in class merchandising results they've seen. And then uh, we're gonna bring up the panel to have a discussion about it. So right now I'd like to introduce Alex May from Movable Inc. to share some of the experiences he and Movable Inc. have had in our space. Thank you. Hey all, uh, I'm Alex May, Associate Director of Client Strategy at Movable Inc., specifically over our travel and hospitality verticals, um, based in Dallas, Texas, so you're gonna hear y'all a lot from me today, so apologies in advance. Uh, but yeah, I'm here to talk about the importance of uh, personalized visual content and merchandising. So why is visual content so important, right? Well, I've got a few statistics here to kind of lay the foundation for that. The first one is that the brain processes images 60,000 times faster than it does text. Uh, additionally, uh, consumers who are shown uh, visual content are, have a 650% um, higher engagement rate with those visual content versus text. And then also customers are 61% uh, or 61% of customers are more likely to buy or book from you uh, if you're serving up personalized um, visual content. So again, you know, we're visual beings as humans. It's kind of our, our superpower. Uh, and when we can deliver on that and, and help our customers by presenting visual aspects that help them um, see the value in what they're searching for and help them curate the experience they want, it's gonna drive value for them, but also for us as well. Before I jump into some examples uh, for some of the clients we work with uh, in Movable Inc., kind of want to set this up with this quote and kind of leave it here. Uh, it's from Leo Burnett, uh, who is the uh, founder of Leo Burnett, a uh, large advertising agency in Chicago. Uh, you might know them from, they developed Tony the Tiger, the Marlboro Man, and for any United folks uh, in the house, uh, he coined the term, uh, fly the friendly skies. Um, but the quote is, what helps people helps business. And, you know, I've worked in retail, fast food, travel, hospitality, and it really rings true for any vertical or any industry. But for us, delivering that visual merchandising and really helping our customers find what they need quickly and easily will not deliver value for them and have them come back to you more and more. It'll deliver value for you as well. All right, so I'm gonna dive into a couple examples, uh, specifically with Frontier Airlines. Uh, these are campaigns we worked on uh, with them at Movable Inc. Uh, this first one here is where we were able to uh, enable Frontier to display inspirational uh, and visual uh, content paired with uh, merchandising the lowest fares based on a customer's uh, preferences, location, buying behaviors, things like that. You can see on the left, uh, there's an example for someone who uh, lives in Denver, Colorado. Maybe it's January. I'm actually from Colorado, so I can relate to the fact that in January, I would do anything to go to the beach. Uh, so we're gonna display that personalized visual content based on their preferences that they've booked in the past and their location, and pair that with the merchandising of the lowest fare from DIA. On the right, it's kind of the opposite. Maybe someone in Miami in February, don't know why you'd wanna leave the beach in February, but maybe you wanna hit the slopes. So we've got um, the snow snowboarding image, and again, pairing it with the lowest fare from their airport, and also showing some other visuals below for some other mountain destinations. Uh, and it may seem simple, right, just showing this simple content, but it drove amazing results. There was a 99% lift in revenue for this campaign, uh, or conversion, excuse me, and a 40% lift in uh, click-through rates. So again, you can drive some meaningful results by simply showing simple visuals that are relevant uh, and will uh, connect with your customers. And then finally, I have this example here uh, where we implemented a live seating uh, map for a campaign where um, Frontier wanted to drive ancillary revenue and upsell their customers to uh, upgraded seats with more legroom. Now, of course, everyone knows the value of extra legroom, right? so it's pretty straightforward, but by implementing this seat map, it really helps drive the customer experience. Uh, you know, I'm someone who may not want the extra legroom if I have to be in a 
don't want to be in a middle seat. Uh, but by looking at this map, I can see, oh, actually, there's some aisle seats, there's some window seats available, and they're actually pretty far up in the aircraft, so I'll be able to deplane faster as well. So this is a no-brainer for me. You've made it simple. I already know what seat I want. I'm going to click through and book that seat. Uh, and you can see there, uh, this campaign drove $1 million in incremental revenue and a 4.2% lift in click-through rate. So again, simple visual, very compelling results. And then I'll, uh, I'll, leave, oh, uh, I'll go with some key takeaways uh, before we jump into the panel. The first one is uh, relevant and visual content will allow customers to process information quickly and boost engagement levels. Second, personalized experiences paired with compelling visual merchandising will be key when trying to convert your customers. And then finally, utilizing meaningful visuals to communicate ancillary experiences and value will help set your brand apart when you're competing for share of wallet. Thank you, and I know we'll uh, pass over to Chris, jump in the panel. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, uh, great feedback. Uh, in, uh, Movable Inc. has done extensive research on digital uh, merchandising across multiple industries. They're doing some great work in the airline space now, demonstrating the, the types of benefits airlines can generate from using it. So, the, the information expertise is really helpful. Uh, I'm excited to introduce the panel now. Um, we've got three uh, uh, exceptional uh, industry merchandisers. Uh, the reason they're exceptional is they're not just thought leaders for the industry, they're also leading the industry and in moving forward in omni-channel merchandising. Um, so we're, we're very proud to introduce Tina Larson from Hawaiian Airlines. Uh, Marla Eichelshain from Air France KLM. And Stacy Stokes from Virgin Australia. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. So, just to give myself a few more minutes to catch my breath, uh, maybe I'm going to volunteer Stacy to give us some initial thoughts and reactions to what you've heard from the first two presentations on our panel. Yeah, absolutely. I think the one thing that resonated with me was getting people excited during the booking process. So I'm fortunate um, today or tonight to be staying in my room that actually overlooks the airport. And do you know how long I stood there just watching these planes take off? And it gets that real excitement and feeling that, um, that I have when I get on a plane and you start to hear those engines roar. And imagine someone booking travel and through their booking experience, that's how they're feeling. And I'd love to be able to create something like that. Any other thoughts or feedback on what you heard already? I mean, I think the numbers show that it works. Um, and it shows that being able to clearly display the value of your product, you know, results in, you know, positive growth. And this is something that the industry needs to be um, investing in. Okay. Anything yeah, maybe else? to add uh, to that, I think um, what said uh, in the McKinsey interview, um, customers aren't looking for price and schedule anymore. But if we look generally when we're booking travel, it is what we see. So there's really a shift needed, I think, to respond to the customer need. And they, what they're looking for is the value and in the, indeed that product, that experience. So really showing that value, um, I think that's what we, we need to head to with the industry. Uh, great points. I think it 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 uh, ties very nicely to what Connie mentioned earlier about how they're testing how that content plays out with the consumer, and from the at least the early things that she shared today, the, their results seem to reflect some of the things that we we heard earlier in the presentation. Um, Tina, I'm going to start with you and ask a question about um, the unique challenge Wine Airline has. You have the luxury of being hubbed in one of the best destinations of the world. Unfortunately, it's a very small local market that has to create some unique uh, selling and merchandising opportunities as you're trying to draw traffic away from other airlines' home markets. How does Hawaiian Airlines think about that? Yeah, so I think, you know, Hawaiian has strong brand presence, you know, up and down the west coast of um, the mainland United States. The further that you get away from it, I think that lessens. You know, I don't think people realize we fly to JFK, we fly to Boston. I think it's also compounded um, internationally, especially when we're up against the foreign flag carriers. So I think our direct team does a great job of showcasing not only the, the beauty of Hawaii, but also um, you know, the value of our products. 
I don't think um, in the indirect channel, I think we sometimes lose control of it. Um, and that's where, for us, our partnership with Root Happy has been extremely helpful because we're able to replicate what we do on HawaiianAirlines.com in the indirect channel. So that travel agencies who may never have flown on Hawaiian, well, first off, they know where we fly. And then secondly, they may, they'll be able to look at this rich content. They'll be able to see the insides of our beautiful aircraft. So they'll be able to see the fact that you know we serve um, free meals on all of our flights to the uh, mainland US and international in all cabins. Um, they'll see that you know one thing that could be of value is on all of our wide body aircrafts, that's a lie flat seat. And that's from out of you know the west coast of the United States, which could be something that really sets us apart and is a differentiator. So, so without the, that visual display, those consumers would never know the investments you've made and the differentiating products and services you're offering. Yeah, and I think it goes a bit beyond you know the 16 attributes of AT Pico. We can go a bit further um, and put in other things. You know, if reliability is something that's really important to a customer, we can use messaging to tell that we have um, for 18 years been the number one on-time uh, U.S. carrier. That might be something that really sets us apart. Very good, thank you for sharing that. One thing I did forget to mention that uh, uh, for those of you in the Slido app, you are able to submit questions to the panel and we'll be taking a look and, and getting to those later uh, in, the, uh, in the discussion, so feel free to submit those. Uh, Marlotte, let me uh, turn to you and some of the work that Air France and KLM have been doing. Um, you're running two brands, you've got two very different uh, website experiences based on the local markets that you compete in. Can you tell us what you've learned from uh, the advancement of your uh, direct channel websites and how you've been applying that for the indirect channels? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, the customers are really looking for value and for choice. And this is something that recently, in recent years, we've been trying to yeah, do that more and more on our direct channels. So, definitely not saying we're there yet, but we're, we're, we've come a long way um, to really offer a richer customer experience. Um, so we're doing that in our direct channels, um, but as in, with most airlines, I suppose, uh, the majority, majority of sales still happens through the indirect channels. So while we, we focus, we've been focusing on the direct channel, I think it's equally important to also engage with our industry partners uh, to also do the same thing in indirect channels. And this is, um, last year we've started the retailing program at Air France and KLM. Um, where we really have a focus on working together with our partners, um, going from the GDS list to a local OTA, uh, to the corporate site, to really enhance their booking tools as well. So we look at our website, um, and we're still on the journey as well. So, but we want to take everybody along on this journey, um, share our best practices, share examples. Um, so we've, we've created guidelines um, in which we, we try to open up the conversation, what the agents can do as well to create a richer uh, travel experience. It, yeah, we've seen some of the th information that you've shared with the industry and it's, uh, it, it's some very progressive ideas that help shape the type of merchandising that you're talking about. Can you share anything about what the reception's been? What's, you've, I know that the GDSs have been a participant in this and some of your major trade partners. Well, what's the initial reaction been? Um, the initial reaction is everybody sees this is the way forward. But it does take a lot of development. If you look at where are we coming from, I think on the slide earlier, where you see just the price and schedule going to a super rich experience to the trip actions example, it's a big, it's a long way. So I think everybody uh, that I've spoken to sees this as a way forward. Everybody's enthusiastic to, to go this way, but it does take time. And I think we, we must not forget that if we don't see the results immediately, it's, it doesn't mean we're not booking any successes. So it, it's a long road, uh, we're on it. Um, but it's important we're also, our offer management teams, also creating more and more offers. Uh, I think ancillary sales, offering even more choices to the customer is also very important. Um, but when we offer, when we create new offers, we must make sure we reach the customer with that. So I think uh, a long way to go, but I think everybody uh, is, uh, at least the faces are headed the same direction. So the, it's a good start. The journey has begun. That, yeah. That's excellent. Exactly. Uh, Stacy, uh, 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 I've got two questions for you. The first one is about how Virgin Australia thinks about investing in new products and services, uh, and then transitions that to how you take it to the marketplace. Can you tell us a little bit about that process yeah, within sure. Virgin Australia? Um, so at Virgin Australia, we are um, proudly in the middle 
um, when we talk about our brand in our market um, and the products that we offer. Um, we have a strong brand presence as well um, in the Australian market and a customer value proposition that does talk about value and choice, so similar things to uh, what Marlette was talking about, um, as well as service. Um, being in the middle does give us some challenges though because it means that we need to be able to have our low-end lead-in price um, but then be able to build bundles or value um, propositions for the customers who want to have a different experience but then also provide premium products um, at the top end. So um, it does that middle um, piece does create those challenges for us. Um, we do have a, like a great booking engine at the moment and as, as well as our, our indirect channel too. Um, but what we're doing at Version Show at the moment is really exciting is we're actually investing in a new merchandising uh, engine. Um, we're going to jump into the NDC game um, as well as update our IBE with our partnership with Datalex. So we've got a lot of rethinking to do in terms of how we have actually Right now, we visualise our offers to our guests in both of our channels. Um, and we've got a really exciting space to be in because we're in that build phase right now. Thank you, Thank you Stacey. Uh, I want to come back uh, to the question that I had asked to Tina about uh, her, her market conditions. You're, you're the reverse. You've got a huge local market and you've also in a very competitive market where merchandising is... The, is the way all airlines compete. Merchandising is very prevalent in Australia. What does that mean for the Virgin Australia merchandising efforts? Yeah, for us, I think coming back to that value and choice um, for our for our customers, but not overcomplicating it, right? This stuff is hard and sometimes we don't get it right. So we're invested um, or leaning into our test and learn program, um, which allows us to either succeed or fail. And I think the, the great the opportunity that we have is to actually fail because you learn so much um, from failing as you do when you, when you succeed in that test and learn um, environment. And we have you know, the very similar, like our, in the market, very similar um, offers there. So we've got to figure out a way for us to, for, to get our customers excited. And, and Alex, you've heard some examples of how the airlines think about home and away markets, how they're introducing things they've learned on their direct channels uh, into the indirect channels. Based on movable inks experience, whether it's with the airlines or in other uh, verticals that, that you look in, any reactions to um, uh, best practices that we're exhibiting or opportunities for airlines to bridge that, that merchandising gap? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to me, the bridge is the customer experience. Um, you know, anyone can deliver uh, lowest price as possible, different destination times, but um, you know, not everyone can deliver uh, additional value in the sense that I think you know, there's a lot of different ways to go about elevating the customer experience. I think the one that I tend to lean towards the most right now that's being more innovated is that attribute-based searches. Um, Expedia mentioned it today. They've had a lot of success. A lot of OTAs are following suit. And what we're seeing is, you know, coming out of the pandemic, we all know travelers are more flexible now, right? They're not as concerned about maybe the times that they're, they're flying or when they're getting to a destination. It's more about the experience. And we're seeing that with hotels a lot, but I think that's bleeding into the airline industry as well, where people are more focused on the experience on, in flight. They're not um, just looking to go A to B. And so being able to present them in a quick and easy way, the different attributes that they might be interested in, whether that's through personalization or whether you don't know the customer on your website and it's, uh, you're just presenting them the tools, any ways that they can build the experience they want is gonna have them come back to you over and over again. So I think that's kind of how I tend to look at it. Thank you. That, uh, good, good coverage from uh, other uh, industries that we can apply to air travel. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, I'll start by saying we thank you for the plug for Root Happy. Immovable Inc. Has, has shared some great examples of what they've done with the industry. But uh, the audience is interested to know what other technology providers or tools are you using to help in your offer presentation as you're thinking about omni-channel distribution? Or you can just say Root Happy does everything really well. <laughs> Root Happy does everything for us. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, in terms of other technologies, um, I think CDPs are huge. Um, I think that's an area that's tending to grow. Uh, helps you deliver um, the right message at the right time to the right person. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, of course, you know, we focus on personalization within your ESP, so any way that you can um, deliver fair prices uh, and enable that API uh, to deliver those different prices to your different uh, channels, whether that be direct, email, uh, paid media, things like that, um, that's kind of uh, what we tend to focus on or seeing success with, with some of our clients. Thank you very much. Um, any other thoughts? Is Rude Happy was the right answer. Thank you. Um, Tina, I'm going to come back to you. Um, we talked a little bit uh, earlier about invest, how airlines make investments. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the priorities are when Hawaiians making investments? Are the, are the primary goals financial, competitive, customer satisfaction? What, what comes into the mix for your airline? Yeah, so like, you know, with branded fares, we implemented that before the pandemic, and a lot of that was a competitive response. We had a lot of you know, from the, the mainland U.S., we had a lot of capacity um, coming into the Hawaiian market, and our competitors had a basic economy product that we needed to compete with. Same thing with, um, you know, international markets. We had a lot of low-cost carriers who had a la carte um, pricing that we had to compete. Um, but also, it was something that the customer wanted. Um, for, you know, with investments on our onboard um, product, that goes to directly to the customer. Um, you know, our um, promise is to deliver authentic Hawaiian hospitality. So what we invest in is so that we can de deliver upon that promise. And so to be able to give our um, customers the experience that they value is something, you know, the next time they come back to Hawaii, um, you know, they'll come back to Hawaiian Airlines. And what was the customer reaction when you introduced the branded fares and started uh, offering the visualization of what kind of experience that they could select from? was basic economy, so <laughs> they didn't get a seating um, assignment. Um, but no, I mean, it was, just, it was another choice for them. Um, and, you know, it was a successful launch that we had, something that we still have in the market. Um, and, you know, it, it's just the first of many opportunities um, that we have available um, going forward. Well, there's, a, uh, there's a famous CNBC interview by uh, the CEO from Delta Airlines uh, when they introduced their version of branded fares and they applied their merchandising uh, tools to, to introduce it to the market. And I, if I get it right, uh, I'm sure there's somebody from Delta who will correct me if I'm wrong, um, but 50% uh, of the customers who were presented with a basic fare upgraded to main cabin, 50%, and the average upsell was about $40 a person, and that was the spirit of merchandising. So. That's the goal of the types of things that we're talking about today and the types of reactions consumers are saying that they'll, they'll make decisions with their wallet when we do that. Absolutely. And, you know, for some people, Hawaii might be out of reach. Um, so a basic economy product is something that makes it a bit more affordable. But for the other customer who is willing to pay for the extras, um, you know, that's a great upsell opportunity for us. Well, we're, we're looking forward to supporting you on that journey. Um, Marlot, uh, you have, uh, the, because of the nature of your network and the impacts of COVID on capacity, interline code sharing has become more important than ever to kind of stretch the networks uh, until things return to some sense of normal. Can you tell us a little bit about what Air France and KLM are doing to help improve the merchandising of those travel experiences for your customers? Yep, absolutely. Um, I think first of all, in, in, in the code sharing and uh, having agreements, I think communication is key. So communication from us as an airline to our customer, but also along with our partners. So we share a, a common message. Um, so with Air France, within Air France KLM, uh, we work together with our joint venture partners, Delta and Virgin uh, Atlantic, um, with whom we actually together created the display guidelines to, uh, that we share with our indirect channels. So we make sure that we are fully aligned on what do we want to, what message do we want to bring out to the industry? Um, and are we all uh, sharing the same vision? Um, but also on our direct channels, um, of course, we share, uh, we also sell other uh, operated airlines. Um, I think the key is that the customer, that we're transparent. So the customer knows what to expect. What experience am I going to get? Um, and in some ways, we have product strategies that are the same way. So that, that works perfectly well. But sometimes with a partner, you have a, a diverging product strategy that can happen. Um, and that's not a problem. But as long as we communicate clearly to the customer, what product are you purchasing? And is that the value that you want so that the customer doesn't get any surprises? So I think communication is really key. Uh, and therefore, we, we work uh, nicely together with uh, with our partners. 
uh, I think that's an important driver of customer satisfaction, especially with those um, unique interline or co chair transitions to help them understand what they need to do and when. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and it's not only customer. So it's from the customer's perspective, of course, we want to place the customer centric, um, make sure the customer has a great experience. But as you also mentioned, upsell, there's also what's in it for us as an airline. Of course, we want to sell our high yielding products. So make sure that we sell, we share them in, a, in an attractive way, but also the way we are published on our partner airlines websites. We also want to make sure that we, we are able to upsell. So I think it's for, a win-win for the customer and for us as an airline as well. Thank you. Uh, some great questions coming from the audience. I will not get to all of these, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, there's one here that asked, how does merchandising fit into your NDC strategy? So for those who've got a, a foot in NDC right now, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, maybe to open that. I think um, the whole NDC, um, the subject is really about the backend, being able to get the right content, and that's very important. But how are you actually going to show that content? So within Air France KLM, we work closely together with the NDC team. Um, so through NDC, you can get the best offers, but you need to be able to display them in the right way. And that's when you really, when merchandising comes in. So I think it's very strongly related to each other. Any other comments on that one? So um, Hawaiian's relatively new in our NDC journey. Um, we just launched it this year, um, but we're really excited about the opportunities that we have, you know, that um, the GDSs haven't been able to provide in terms of merchandising. Um, we partner with Fairlogix, and we think that we have, um, you know, a very powerful merchandising manager. And so to be able to put forth you know, bundles, um, you know, just new, new offers that the customer values is something we're really excited about. So do you treat uh, a traditional offer the same as an NDC when you think about merchandising or is there a different perspective or, or are they the same? So a traditional, like a non-NDC offer that you would have done pre-NDC when, you, when you're merchandising that to third parties, are they the same or do you do something different in terms of the visualization? I would say that they're probably the same. I mean, it is the same product, it's just in different channels. Same? Yeah, I would say the same. Okay. That, 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 I think, thinking that. <laughs> I think from a consumer Feeling standpoint, they really don't care <laughs> where the offer came from. The point is, am I seeing what my experience is going to be like and do I have control over the experience? Um, there was a, the, there's a question about as each airline, well, and this is for the airlines and for Alex, um, as you're working to extend your merchandising strategies outside your direct channels, how are you collaborating with GDSs, with um, OTAs and meta search sites to uh, achieve the, your mutual ambitions? What are those conversations like? Uh, how do you find, um, uh, what approaches are you finding most effective to achieve your goals? Well, I'm really excited about the conversations that we've been having with the agencies. Um, we are, we're seeing um, positive conversations about our NDC, um, the product that we've put in the market. Um, we're, we're having great conversations around our distribution strategy, um, and we're getting um, a lot of agencies converting to our NDC platform. Um, that was very different conversation that we had um, before the pandemic, and now it's entirely different. So it's been um, a great uh, change for us. Um, and really, when we talk to agencies, it's about the partnership, it's about the opportunities to be better at merchandising. That's really exciting. And it's just this true sense of what can we do differently together. Yeah. We're, we're hearing that as well. So um, the Australian market's really excited about what opportunities we have in terms of the um, of NDC um, and how we can uh, create those different offers and, and visualize them differently. So um, we're looking forward to being able to roll it out next year and um, take some advantage. It's it. Alex, anything? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I tend to uh, deal more with the, the direct side. Uh, I don't mingle too much with the partnerships between like an airline and an OTA, but I think the biggest thing is really, to Jill's point, delivering a consistent experience across the different channels. Uh, and it can be with your own channels as well, uh, not necessarily... Um, third-party channels, but I mean, certainly I think that's the biggest thing is um, delivering the consistent experience. And I will say like Hawaiian does do a fantastic job of displaying uh, inspirational content for some of their packages uh, and driving that ancillary revenue through excursions and things like that and making sure that you can take that beautiful content and those great messages and have that translate on some of your other uh, indirect channels um, is huge. 
Uh, one last question from the audience. If, AK, if ATP Co. could do one thing for you tomorrow in your merchandising journey, what would it be? I would say uh, for NDC, let's um, combine Route Happy and HA Connect, which is our NDC platform, because uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity there uh, going forward. All right, Doug, we're on that. <laughs> yeah, and I would say that with Road Happy, there's already a really nice integration of helping visualize offers, which is critical. So I think just keep going the way it's going with, with Road Happy uh, and, and uh, integrations such as that. Uh, I think we as airlines really benefit from that. I'd like to see a little bit of VR in Route Happy, I think, like virtual reality of being able to walk onto the plane yourself. Um, and, you know, maybe you've got good skills now, Chris, so. <laughs> All right, well, I'm sure Daria will love to uh, pursue the virtual reality, so we'll add that to the list. Alex, uh, I know we're, we're somewhat new uh, in working with Movable Inc. Any, from what you've uh, seen and heard over the last uh, half day, anything jump out that we can do to help? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think overall, I just would love to continue to grow the partnership. And just again, going back to the presentation, just figuring out how we can pair that visualized merchandising with personalization to create that really compelling uh, message to deliver to everyone's customers. Well, thank you very much. So uh, just to wrap up the panel, um, I think some of the things that we've, we've heard today is that uh, consumers react favorably when we put the right imagery uh, where they're doing their shopping. Um, the satisfaction's higher, they're willing to, to pay more to have control over their experience uh, when it's done effectively. We've got uh, channel partners in the industry like Expedia who are doing some great um, experiments to figure out how to really optimize that, whether it's mobile um, or on the, on the website. Uh, but uh, thinking about globalization, not just home market, how you work in your international markets, whether it's language or the local shopping and um, customs is important. How you work with partners uh, in terms of aligning your messaging, helping the customer navigate what their travel experience may be like is important. Uh, in a market like Australia, which is well ahead of, of many other regions in terms of most of the airlines are in heavily merchandising in all channels, ensuring you're, you're, you're putting the best story forward is important. Um, also appreciate uh, third party perspectives that Movable Inc. brought that they're seeing it in other industries, they're testing it with partners today, and they're seeing the types of results that effective merchandising can provide. Um, so thank you very much for sharing your stories. Uh, we're really honored to have you uh, share what you've achieved so far, and we're looking forward to supporting you along the way. Thank you very much. Thank you.